Hi, as you just heard, I'm John Sternlicht. I'm the CEO of the Economic Development Alliance of Skagit County, and I'm here to talk today about unconscious bias, and particularly its impacts for economic development. And uh, I look forward to sharing this with you and then maybe having some discussion afterwards. Today we're going to talk about how unconscious bias affects us all more than we realize. And the key is learning to recognize it, recognize its effects, and then find out about strategies on how to overcome the effects of unconscious bias. So again, this will be about an hour with additional time for discussion, I hope. We're not going to talk much today around about issues around social justice and policing. That topic alone is probably worth its own semester course and that wouldn't even scratch the surface. So we're going to focus today more on issues that impact economics, economic development and business decisions. Uh, those are not in the headlines as much and they're a little more difficult to spot. The warning here is that the goal is for us to keep it real and so in order to do that, we all have to listen with open ears, open hearts, and open minds. Uh, and a good sense of humor never hurts. Remember not to take any of this overly personally because it's not that kind of subject. In order to level set, let's listen to a video to tell us a little bit about what unconscious bias really is. New research from the fields of neuroscience and social psychology has shed light onto the concept of unconscious bias. But what exactly is unconscious bias and how does it affect our behaviors and decisions? Unconscious biases are simply our unintended people preferences. They are formed by our socialization, our personal experiences, and the representations of different groups in the media. These experiences act as social filters in which we make assessments and judgments of people around us. Research tells us that human beings have a natural tendency to place individuals into social categories. These categories are often based on visual cues such as gender, cultural background, age, height, or body size. We also categorize based on social background, job roles, religious identity, or political affiliation. The unconscious brain uses associations based on social categories to develop biases. For example, if we are constantly exposed to women as primary school teachers or receptionists, or men as plumbers and organizational leaders, these associations become wired within the human brain. The unconscious brain uses social categories to make unconscious judgments about people who are similar to us and people who are different from us. A common form of unconscious bias is affinity bias. This type of bias impacts talent processes in organizational decision making, including how we recruit. Managers are more likely to hire people who look similar or with sounding names to them. Work allocation. Managers are more likely to assign key client projects to individuals within their teams who they have an unconscious affinity with. Performance. Where there is some kind of affinity, Managers are more likely to spend time informally discussing positive contributions to the team and will focus on development and future work plans. For those where there is little affinity, managers are more likely to question past performance. The conversation will be less friendly and even hostile at times. Unconscious bias often results in a set of micro-behaviors. Examples of positive micro-behaviors include supporting the ideas of someone with who you have an unconscious affinity whilst in a team meeting or simply wanting to have coffee with someone like you. Examples of negative micro-behaviors include checking emails on your phone whilst talking to a colleague or cutting someone off in a meeting. Often our intention is not to make biased decisions and through a focus on conscious thinking and by creating inclusive work cultures, we can learn to control our unconscious judgments and mitigate the impact of bias on our talent programs. So we've heard about the brain science around unconscious bias. It's when you form a quick opinion about a situation or a person without being consciously aware of it. 
our brains form these biases about knowledge of social situations, customs, attitudes, our cultures, our stereotypes, emotional reactions, and all sorts of things. These things we learn through our family, through our society, uh, and just life experiences through particularly exposure to media and social attitudes. And they start at birth, if not maybe before. So some of the other things we might call unconscious bias would be uh, first impressions, gut reaction, vibes, reminds me of where you have positive or negative transference to somebody or something, or a snap judgment. That is exactly what it sounds like. These biases can be positive or negative or mixed. And again, it should be a cause for awareness and thought and pause, not a cause for shame or judgment because it's universal. You might be wondering how some of these things could be positive, negative, or mixed. Sometimes a positive uh, bias about a particular group can serve to put them in a box. Um, if you say, for example, that uh, Asian people are so good at math, then you're probably going to be less inclined and less comfortable seeing them as the quarterback of the football team or a star soccer player. Uh, those are things that we need to be aware of because, again, it forecloses all sorts of important opportunities. These otherwise may be facially complementary biases can really serve to put people in a box that excludes them from doing other things. So how does all this come into play in economic development? You will see this in economic development in all sorts of other fields, in hiring and promotion, in career advancement and assignments, as we saw in the video. You'll also see it in finance, business finance, venture capital, lending, uh, and in salaries as well. Unconscious bias comes into play in how people view neighborhoods and community development. What is gentrification? What is blight? There are studies that show that people are more commonly calling blight things that happen in communities of color, even if the same things happen in other communities. We need to look at the support we provide to businesses and entrepreneurs and make sure that our own unconscious bias isn't making decisions for us. Business attraction, the kind of businesses we want to bring to a community. What unconscious biases have we formed here? In programming that we have to serve our community, and also in government relations, public relations, all kinds of, of communications. What are some of the subtle and unconscious ways in which we represent different people? So you might be thinking at this point, as a lot of people do, but I'm not racist, really. Well, I believe you. And by saying that, that doesn't immunize you. Because again, we are all subject to these unconscious biases because we all have a brain. And this is, is brain science. Again, it's nothing to be ashamed of, but it is something to be aware of and work on. So things that are also not vaccinations against unconscious bias. Check my closet. There's no Ku Klux Klan robe in there, so I'm not racist. Also not relevant. But I have a black or substitute some other minority group, friend, relative, in-law, colleague, neighbor. Um, I don't see color. Well, what does that really say? When you say, I don't see color, that probably means you are endeavoring to see everybody as white when everybody's not white. When you say, I don't see color, that means you don't see everybody as they really are. Um, and it also might beg the question, do you see color as a negative? And that's why you're trying not to see it. And then another, aren't we all just Americans? Well, yes, we are. And one of the wonderful things about this country is that we are quite varied and we need to see that as more likely an advantage than a disadvantage. 
So how does bias persist? If we set aside for a moment outright express deliberate sign-waving racism, sexism, anti-Semitism, homophobia, ableism, ageism, lookism, and all the other sorts of pernicious isms, what do we still have? Well, we still have institutional, systemic, structural racism. We still have the legacies of slavery and the racism that came and was enforced by law throughout the following century. We still have disparate impact and we still have unconscious bias. So let's think about it. Women have had the vote for 100 years now. Do you think women have equality in the boardroom or in the state house or the US Capitol? Here's another question. How many black Fortune 500 CEOs do you think there are now? And do you think there have been since they started publishing this list in 1955? So think about it. We'll get to the answer later and do not cheat by Googling. First, let's talk about institutional or systemic racism. I want to recommend a book called The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein. This examines all sorts of various government programs that largely came about after World War II that were designed to benefit veterans and all kinds of other people, built the suburbs, um, healthcare, transportation, all kinds of things like that. This shows the systemic racism in all these areas in education, finance, healthcare, communities, transportation, business, in the workplace, in addition to the criminal justice system. So uh, I recommend that book and, and ask for your attention to it because it's got fascinating and important details in there that we largely don't know about. What is disparate impact? So this is, for me, a flashback to law school. Disparate impact is when you might have a law or a standard or a requirement that on its face might be completely neutral, but the way it operates is consistently discriminatory against a protected class. So you might have job requirements or project requirements that aren't necessary, but that also serve to exclude a particular group, whether it's women or people of color or people under or above a certain age. So what that does is that operates to exclude lots of diverse choices and lots of opportunities for stronger teams and stronger candidates. And it favors more traditional read majority candidates. So think about Hollywood casting and how that tends to go the way of most people's unconscious bias. Uh, you may have heard about in the Harry Potter series when it went live on the London stage, they cast Hermione, one of the characters, as a black woman, a young black woman. And people went nuts because they just knew that Hermione wasn't black. Well, how did you know that when she was in a book and there weren't any pictures? Um, the author herself, said that she had kind of always envisioned Hermione as black, but had never really said anything about it. In the uh, disparate impact comes up in law school from a case from the 70s, when airlines used to require that their flight attendants, then called stewardesses, be attractive to their business travelers. Well, of course, in the 70s, the business travelers on airplanes were almost exclusively male, and the airlines thought, well, let's make sure we, you know, give them a pleasant flight by having only very attractive women in the cabin. Well, that has nothing to do with the legitimate job requirements of a flight attendant. And uh, Pan Am, in that case, was forced to change its practices. Let's talk about all the different kinds of biases, and there may be as many, if we're looking at the brain science again, as 50,000 of them. But let's look at, let's say, an even 10 right now. 
First of all, there's affinity bias. And that's where we prefer people who are similar to us, look similar, have similar qualities, similar names, maybe religion, culture. And what you might say in a workplace setting is, well, that person fits our culture. That can also operate to defeat any kind of effort at diversity, because likely people who share a culture are going to be pretty monolithic. Attribution bias. We're, we're going to go alphabetically here in the top 10. That's where you attribute success or failure to either skill or luck, depending on the group that you're talking about. So if it's you and your own group, you're likely to attribute uh, your success to skills and hard work, where for others it may be luck or some kind of favoritism. So responsibility or, and control or externalities. Beauty bias, I think that's pretty clear. Um, attractiveness, appearance, weight, height, those things are generally irrelevant to job performance unless you are a fashion model, maybe a basketball player. Um, but think about it. There could be situations where your beauty works against you. I can easily imagine that if you are um, trying to be a physics professor and you come in looking like a fashion model, that you may have a little bit of a tougher road there. There was a time when people thought attractive women could not be comedians because they weren't going to be funny. Uh, conformity bias. That's where you kind of go along with the group uh, rather than speaking up on something that you think is amiss or omitted. Confirmation bias. We see a lot of that in the media and in news today where people seek out information that conforms to or confirms the biases they already hold and tend to reject information that contradicts it. Gender bias, this would be based on societies and maybe your own notions of who, what gender should fill which roles. And this is especially sneaky. Um, I know with my kids, uh, purposefully, we took them to actually an African-American woman pediatrician. And at one point, my four-year-old said, I don't remember what we were talking about, boys are doctors and girls are nurses. And I was like, huh, where do you get that? And I sort of got the, well, everybody knows that. Uh, and I said, and your doctor is a, and he said, oh, well, she's a girl. I said, okay, well, just remember that. Um, age bias. Those can actually work both ways because you can have biases about what age somebody should be doing a particular thing. You'd probably rather see a somewhat older doctor or airline pilot uh, and you might expect to see a somewhat younger um, athlete, for example. Those are actually going to work against you in a lot of different ways because you will miss a lot of great opportunities if you exclude folks based on that. And then there are three more effects uh, that are not quite biases, but they're effects. The contrast effect. So that's where you compare similar things to one another rather than judging them independently. And that really allows you to miss the full picture of somebody. And the last two kind of go together, they're opposites. There's the halo effect and the horns effect. And you can probably guess what those are. If you have a, a bias in favor of somebody, then they can do no wrong. Everything they do is golden, and it's as if they have a halo over their heads. Uh, so one great feature or that positive bias blinds us to all the rest, whether it's bad or good. And then the horns effect is the inverse. One negative feature, characteristic, or, or, uh, or perception can blind you to all the good about that person or that situation. 
So to summarize that, becoming aware or more aware of all of these different biases and effects that you personally hold, that we all personally hold, will strengthen your ability to make fairer and more informed decisions about recruitment or programming or all kinds of other things where you're called upon to evaluate and judge people. Here's another video that talks about the different kinds of bias that's good for us to listen to right now. How do you decide who makes the team? Who gets an opportunity and who gets cut? We want to believe that we think rationally and objectively, that all of our motivations are pure and free from biases, but we know that's not always the case because of our potential blind spots. Blind spots, or unconscious biases, are mental shortcuts that help us make sense of the millions of pieces of data we take in each day. They can potentially influence our decisions. Not all biases are bad. It's normal to have a favorite sports team, or food, or prefer being around your own family. Having a bias doesn't always mean you're against something. In fact, the halo effect means exactly the opposite. It's when you favor a person based on a positive first impression. In your mind, they can do no wrong, even when they prove otherwise. And assuming someone will be great at absolutely everything can actually end up setting them up for failure. The horns effect happens when someone is defined by a negative first impression. No matter what they do, they can't shake it. Halo and horns often carry over into other areas and color all the ways we see and experience someone. The halo and horns effects can also be reinforced by confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is when we look for evidence that supports our beliefs and ignore evidence that contradicts them. Let's take a little test. What rule defines this number sequence? Now that you've got your rule in mind, can you come up with a series of numbers that also fit that rule? What about these? Which sequences fit? If you said 20, 22, 24, you'd be wrong. Actually, all of them fit. The simple rule was that the numbers got bigger. It's likely that your unconscious mind quickly saw a pattern of even numbers that go up by two, and that narrowed your thinking. This shows that confirmation bias can rob us of other possible solutions. Numerous studies have shown that people are more likely to seek out information that confirms a belief and disregard information that doesn't. One study found that people spent over 36% more time reading articles that confirm their beliefs. In the business world, this habit could end up squashing innovation before it starts. So what can we do when we're wired to hang on to halo, horns, and pay more attention to things that confirm our beliefs? How can we counteract our unconscious bias? The first step is to be open. Try not to let one shining moment or one speed bump sway your opinion forever. Make sure you look at all the evidence objectively. Play your own devil's advocate and seek out contradictory views. And slow down your thinking. Ask questions and bring in other perspectives to expand your point of view. When we recognize our blind spots, that's when we can get beyond halo and horns. That's when we can overcome confirmation bias. And that's when we can see people for who they are and who they can become. So we see that unconscious bias can give us blind spots. And they're not always bad. As the video showed us, our brain has to process billions of pieces of information really quickly. And you can see how, for purposes of evolution, this was really important. So it's not all bad but we need to recognize when we need to work on it. So what are some real life instances of unconscious bias? Another book that I would like to refer you to is called Biased by uh, Dr. Jennifer Eberhardt, and uh, she's from Stanford University. Her, one of her main premises is you don't have to be racist to be biased, and it's important to remember that. There was a 2003 study by Bertrand and Mullenathan on the impact of racially identified names in job searching. So this study, which has been repeated a number of times, uh, of the US labor market documented the impact 
of these racially identifiable names in the job application process. They would match identical resumes with names that sounded either typically black or typically white in applications for the same job openings. In tallying all these responses, Tamika, Keisha, Tyrone, and Jamal were 50% less likely to get a callback than Jeffrey, with the English spelling, Brad, Emily, and Jill. Again, identi identical qualifications. Sadly, I have to tell you that companies identifying themselves as equal opportunity employers fared no better than any other company and were just as likely to discriminate in this matter, manner, perhaps unconsciously. So again, this study has been validated many times in the ensuing years. The summary analysis reveals that white applicants received 36% more callbacks than black applicants and 24% more than Latinos. I would suspect that most foreign sounding names suffer as well. So what do people do? As a result, many uh, minority applicants will anglicize, and I use that word deliberately, will anglicize their names, they will omit obvious minority affiliations and groups, and according to Dr. Eberhardt, they would add typically, and I'm going to put air quotes around this, white sounding interests. It's called whitening the resume. And this happens in other places too, for example, in Airbnb, uh, not just in the business world. Neuroimaging studies show that the human brain has to work harder to process positive information about someone from an outgroup. And that same information from someone in the in-group, someone with whom you have an affinity and who is like you, is much more readily accepted. So that's what some people are talking about when they talk about a comfortable fit in terms of a hire and why that is prioritized over diversity. So, what are some bias impacts in finance and talent? The research shows that minorities and women are held to higher standards than white men in competing for investment dollars. Uh, Dr. Eberhardt is with Spark at Stanford University, which is Social Psychological Answers to Real Questions. That's the name of her institute. The study looked to the causal role that race plays in the investment market. And they found that the more qualified the black-led team was, or appeared to be, the more bias they faced because they were perceived as being less capable of actually executing on their strategy. So the conclusion of that study is that in an investment world that's already 99% white and male, it may turn out that black people are turned away not because they are less qualified than white men, but because they are equally or more qualified. You might wonder what got me intent on talking about this issue so publicly. Well, I was at an uh, International Economic Development Council annual conference just a couple of years ago. And there was a panel <clears throat> and a very respected economic developer was talking about venture capital. And he said, and I quote, venture capital is a young man's game. Well, I can imagine that all the women in the audience felt very excluded from that statement. As someone who is no longer young, I'm sure I felt some kind of way about that too. Um, but it's the kind of thing that you say, perhaps unconsciously, that is really quite exclusionary. There was another session in that same conference where a panelist was talking about how you deal with your clients. And he said, the most important thing is that you, again I'm quoting here, that you know your client's wife's name and their favorite football team. Well, I am a male business professional married to a man, so I felt excluded. 
I am sure that all the potential female clients felt excluded. Uh, and I can tell you that if I were looking for someone to do work for me, there are about a thousand things that I would consider more important than my favorite football team, which is, by the way, the Seahawks, if you wanted to know that. But that's not really what's going on. So he was showing his bias about what clients look like and what important business people you want to court look like. Uh, and then, of course, I formed my own bias, which was not complimentary, about this, this fellow who was, couldn't have been any more than 40. But I formed a negative impression of him as provincial, narrow-minded, and uh, not very forward-thinking, and perhaps a relic of a bygone era. But I also felt excluded from whatever he was talking about. So bias works must, much the same against women uh, because sometimes women are perceived, according to this study and others, as too smart, and that's a negative. I want to let you think about being smart being a negative for just a minute. There was a sociological study by Natasha Quadlin that found that resumes from men with high GPAs generate nearly twice the rate of callbacks as resumes from women with exactly the same grades. Among math majors, that gap is three to one rather than two to one. So what does that say about our perceptions? In follow-up interviews, the researchers found that gendered stereotypes were the cause. We value men for being competent as well as strong and assertive, uh, and we evaluate women for their likability. So if a woman is very smart, but you know, uh, okay on the likability scale, she's not going to do as well as a man who is very smart and just okay on the likability scale, because we have different expectations of men in terms of getting along being authoritative or being easy to get along with. Outspoken women or authoritative women are often regarded as difficult when men are authoritative men. So to illustrate that, some economists, Golden and Rouse, examined gender bias in orchestra hiring practices in 2000. And again, this has been replicated since then and validated. They found that blind, and here I mean literally blind auditions, where the gender of the candidate was unknown, they hid the candidate for the orchestra audition behind a curtain, and they even muffled the footsteps on the floor so you couldn't somehow gather whether it was, a, was or might be a man or a woman walking to the chair. That blind audition practice resulted in 50% more women finalists and fully a third more women hires in the orchestra. Had nothing to do with their ability on whatever instrument they were playing, of course. Bias regarding appearance. This is key and it's something we make snap judgments on. I know I do all the time. Um, you might have some kind of reaction to the suit and tie I'm wearing, or even the fact that I'm wearing a suit and tie, as opposed to something else. So our ingrained perceptions judge a lot more than race and gender. We look at size, looks, accent. Uh, we might understand someone's sexual orientation or gender identity and expression and that all gets filtered through our unconscious perceptions. So you all probably remember the incident in the Starbucks in Philadelphia a couple of years back where a white, young white female Starbucks employee called the police on three black men who were in there, uh, sitting there waiting for a meeting. They had not ordered anything, and she decided they were suspicious and she called the police. The police came and some of the white customers in there said, 
what's going on here? We were doing exactly the same thing as those guys, sitting here and not ordering anything, and nobody called the police on us. So why is that? And of course, it was a, a big blowback on Starbucks for which the CEO apologized. Um, and that caused a lot of change at Starbucks. There was the effort for let's talk about race, which was, I think, largely made fun of. Obviously, you're not going to solve uh, these issues by just talking about it or writing something on a coffee cup. But you know what? It's a start. And more recently, Starbucks has put in the evaluation process for all their executives how well they're doing on diversity hiring and other equity and inclusion issues. So there's another study that showed that quote unquote baby-faced white men did not fare well in hiring while baby-faced black men tended to fare better than black men generally. The researchers wanted to know why. And they concluded that while white men can and should be perceived as commanding and authoritative looking, those same qualities in black men are often perceived as threatening or scary. So that's why those who, were, who appeared more baby-faced uh, were judged more favorably because people found them less threatening. People did not find white men who might scowl or look authoritative or not be baby-faced as threatening. And conversely, baby-faced white men may have been judged harshly for not being authoritative enough. So, now we come to the answer to the quiz that I put to you earlier. Uh, there are currently 19 black CEOs in the entire history of the Fortune 500 since 1955. Why, after so many years, is this number still so stubbornly low? Um, and you see there the new Walgreens CEO, Roz Brewer, who was formerly the COO of Starbucks, is going to be, uh, I, actually, I think she took office sometime this month. She, we just found out, is going to be joined by the second uh, black woman in the Fortune 500 CEO group. TIAA, the investment group, uh, had Roger Ferg has Roger Ferguson Jr., who is also black, as the CEO, and he is going to be succeeded for the first time in the Fortune 500 by another black CEO, Thesunda Brown Duckett. Um, Kenneth Frazier from Merck and Marvin Ellison from Lowe's are also in that very, very small group. Um, this is, so let's talk about uh, a record as of the first quarter of 2021 of this year, a record 41 out of 500 CEOs in the Fortune 500 are women. And for those of you who are quick on math, that's about 8%. So obviously not proportional. Obviously, I would think a lot lower than what the public perception would be. And some of that is going to be because people do not perceive women and black men and women as being capable of running a Fortune 500 company. Um, it takes intentionality. That's what TIAA says about how they have ended up with now three, because previously they had one when TIAA was not on the Fortune 500. Um, how have they ended up with one black CEO succeeding another? It's intentionality. It's making the effort on diversity, equity, and inclusion. So again, Starbucks took that sweeping action, and it makes us wonder not only how these stereotypes cloud our perceptions and affect what they do, what we do and think and say, but also what can we do about that? So Starbucks started by just writing something on a cup and they finished by tacking their executive compensation to success in this area. What's our to-do list then? Well, we have to listen, hear, feel, think, with open ears, open minds, open hearts, 
Empathy is what we need in order to understand that others may have different experiences and different challenges and different perspectives in life. I read last year a very astonishing and disturbing number from both uh, results of a Gallup poll and another from NPR, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and the Chan School of Public Health at Harvard. This study showed that fully 55% of white people in the United States believe that the most prevalent form of discrimination in our country today is against white people. Although most of those 55% say they have not personally experienced any of that. So the question that that raises is, do we recognize bias and discrimination against groups to which we do not belong? Um, I often say that it is not up to white people to say that there's no racism. It's not up to straight people to say that there's no homophobia. It's not up to men to say that there is no sexism out there. Uh, for all the dads out there, I am sure that we felt that labor and childbirth were not that big a deal. Well, it wasn't to us. But you'd have to be blind or intentionally blind to not realize that it's different for the woman giving birth. This is much the same. So we have to take time to reflect and question and make objective, well-considered, and documented decisions to mitigate the inherent biases we face. So if we're thinking about job descriptions, we need to comb through those job descriptions for language that might seem to indicate a bias. Um, if we're saying he or she about the person that we expect will fill this job, for example. Um, but it, it really takes a lot of examination. Um, and we also have to consider whether there are requirements in there that are, are not really valid or not valid anymore. Um, and then in dealing with community members, forging personal connections tends, according to all the research, to mitigate the impact of unconscious bias. And this was easy for us to see with the um, LGBTQ equality movement. It wasn't that long ago that most people, when polled, said they did not know anybody who was gay. Um, of course they did. They just didn't know it because the people who were gay and lesbian were not out. They were not public about it. And as soon as that started happening more, and more and more people started realizing that their friends, their relatives, their neighbors, their coworkers, and all kinds of other people that they already liked were gay or lesbian, they changed their attitudes. They started shifting and becoming more open to these personal connections and also more opposed to various forms of discrimination. And that's how we can start to override inherent bias. So again, avoiding in language and assumptions, both positive and negative, uh, biases about people and groups. So let's not assume that doctors and senators and mayors and CEOs, astronauts, engineers, and pilots are all male. And let's not assume that nurses, teachers, social workers, assistants, uh, beauticians are all female. Let's mix it up. I know for fun, I like to do that just in everyday conversation when I'm talking about an engineer. I, I used that just this morning in a, in a presentation. I said, an engineer needs to have good verbal skills so she can explain her projects to other lay people. Um, I think that tends to jolt people for a second or a half a second, but it's important to do that as an exercise even just for ourselves. So we remember that things aren't always how we might assume. What else? Revamping our company practices. You remember when we were talking about TIAA and their intentionality and about Starbucks. These things have to be intentional and they have to come from the top, but also be adopted by the entire organization. 
So these things might have to do with hiring, but they might also have to do with who gets FaceTime with the boss. Is it only the people with whom the boss feels some affinity? How do we manage employees and make assignments and do our evaluations? Let's think about situations where all of these connections and these affinities were formed in clubs or neighborhoods or churches that were and perhaps still are restricted or at least segregated based on gender, race, religion, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status. Let's monitor again our job descriptions to make sure nothing creeps in there about gender or other kinds of bias that would eliminate people from consideration and it, frankly harm the company or the organization because you're missing out on an opportunity for a different perspective. Uh, avoiding those things is one thing. You might also consider phone interviews for an initial screening. And you always have to have an objective set of standards and ask candidates the same thing. You don't want to ask a woman candidate something you wouldn't ask a male candidate and vice versa. Although that was clearly the practice for quite a long time. It's important to take your time during the decision-making process. Accuracy is more important than speed. You remember how these things are called snap judgments or reactions and how these can create blind spots. Stopping and thinking about some of these ideas and attitudes can help us avoid some of these mistakes or, or missed opportunities. So the things you value in a person might come in a package that's different from what you expect. Avoid the contrast effect. So think of each person as an individual rather than comparing them to someone else. Judge each one on his or her own merit. And then to prevent selective observation, look at them from all different sides and all different qualities and characteristics and circumstances and justify your assessments with varied evidence. That helps you challenge your intuition and it also helps if you have other people with different perspectives and attitudes and ideas that are helping with those decisions. That's Again, when it's important, undoing affinity bias, to have different kinds of people in on the decision. That will address your own preconceptions. The group won't be free of preconceptions, but you'll have different ones. And when you have a discussion about it, you'll be able to ferret those things out. And it'll lead you to more diversity and strength. Preventing attribution bias is important in changing your outlook uh, to assess others more accurately. And that's where we have to work harder, as we learned, to process information about an outgroup, about people who are different from us, and not magnify shortcomings, and not magnify or amplify positive associations either. We have to cultivate that kind of empathy and the self-awareness around that where we're honest with ourselves about our biases and that we recognize them and we work to control them. We actively look for ways to expand our own frame of reference and update our views. And so that means we have to be open to change. These values are ones that we set from the tops of our organizations and throughout. They can come from the middle too and spread throughout. And it's important to improve everyone's awareness of equality and diversity. The research about uh, this kind of information and training around it is so important. There's lots of research out there as well about the enhanced strength of a multicultural workplace where we can have the benefit of all different kinds of perspectives and thought processes and ideas. And if you have a bunch of people who are all the same, you're not going to have that kind of diversity. And in biology, we know diversity is important. In 
companies, this is no less important because you've got to make those adaptations and changes and look at things from the angles of all your customers who are not themselves all the same. Setting these objective employment practices where we use uniform questions and standards, write everything down, and we have to justify our choices either or both in writing and to our team that's evaluating the applicants. This is going to reduce conformity bias and affinity bias and help us gain a well-rounded pool of candidates if we have a well-rounded team that's looking for them. One more video as we start to wrap up about how words have meaning. What would the world look like if everybody were aware of the stereotypes that they have and the biases that they have? When we talk about unconscious bias, we're basically saying our worldview can actually exert an influence beyond our conscious awareness, and it creates ambiguity. If you go to an engineer who's built something extremely innovative, and you say, who do you think your user is? This is where I have the most fun. My name is T.B. Raman, and I led our work on Android accessibility for three years. Write down everything that you think you know about your user with respect to abilities, inabilities, special abilities, disabilities. Almost every assumption that you write down on that whiteboard about this is the user I think I'm building for is questionable because our various unconscious biases define the boundaries you're unwilling to expand. These biases, they're the shortcuts that our brain has created so that we can deal with the information that we process every single day. Right when we see anyone, whether we think about it or not, we are implicitly, automatically making judgments about how warm incompetent that person or thing is. All humans need to make decisions, and so we fill in the blanks because our brains are wired to do that, and we fill in with things we don't know, with you know past experience. Oh, you pattern map to someone I think I should hire, so I'm gonna hire you versus this person because they didn't map because I can't fill in the blank because they don't look like me or they're not from my same background, and so I can't see how they're gonna make the jump. Every single person is great at things that you may not expect them to be, but it's really hard for us to see that when we're so powerfully guided by the things we expect to be true in the world. I grew up surrounded with this conversation about what you can't do and what you won't be able to do. My name's Enrico and uh, I'm an autistic software engineer. The first time I go through the performance review process, I was asked for five strengths. It was the first time that I had ever been prompted to think in that way about myself and it was really a life-changing moment for me. When we are working in our day-to-day -day jobs, we are still making judgments about the people around us, about the resumes we see, about the employees that we're trying to decide you know, whether to put them on teams or not. People are very wedded to the idea that they can perceive something objectively, and statistically they're wrong, but it's hard. You become attached to this idea that you can assess something by looking at it. These subtle, Assumptions we make about people can have lasting effects on who we're promoting, who we're hiring, who we're putting in leadership positions. We have the responsibility to understand the assumptions that we make and understand the errors that we make. But it's not just for the collective good. If you take the time to understand more about this, there are things that you can implement for yourself that'll help you develop as a leader and to do your job even better. It made me realize how often I have a very strong belief that is simply incorrect. When I look at one of these evaluation situations, the first question is how can I eliminate the sources of potential bias and leave just the data so we can actually make better decisions? If you're not conscious of the biases that you have, you're just not contributing at the level that you could and you're not innovating at the level you could and so your products won't be as good, your results won't be as good. When you think outside the box with respect to the assumptions you made about how somebody would use this wonderful thing you built, and when you sort of broaden that perspective as to who you change the world for, you build something even bigger. So, in closing, how can we counteract 
our own unconscious bias. Well, be open, be self-aware, and we challenge our own assumptions and our own inclinations. Play your own devil's advocate. That's how it's done. And slow down your thinking to try to recognize your blind spots and ask yourself why you think a different way. Figure out if that reason is valid or not. It may well be valid, but it may not. If I'm getting ready to ask a woman whom I'm interviewing about her family obligations or her plans to have children, I need to think, would I ask a man the same question? By the way, illegal in either case, so please don't do it. But turn every situation around or on its head to see if it's fair. Would I assume that a white person got into college on their own merits and a black person benefited from affirmative action? Or would I assume that a black person came from an impoverished background and a white person did not? Would I assume that a minority candidate selected was automatically less qualified than a rejected white candidate? All those assumptions are false bases for judging anybody. And those are the kinds of things that you hear all the time, but a lot of the time we don't question them. Uh, and those are the things that will help us be more successful in everything we do, not only in our work lives, but in our personal lives. So let's talk. I look forward to hearing your questions.